policy lecture series sponsored by Ananta. Professor Sugata Bose, Professor Naurem Lokendra Singh, Professor Amma Yunna, Dr. Vizalaski Prara, Professor Ibo, Professor Nimai, my junior colleagues, scholars, welcome to the Ananta sponsor for policy lecture series. Let me highlight just three things. One, what is Ananta group or what is Ananta as a think tank? Ananta is one of the pillars of the main pillars of the Ananta Center is leadership development by encouraging frank and open dialogue on most important issues facing Indian society to help foster its transformation. The center also engages civil society, business, government, and other key stakeholders on issues of importance to India's development, foreign policy, strategic affairs, and national security. You can access the website of this in the Ananta Aspen, A S P E N, uh, you know, and you can see what are the activities this center has been undertaking in the past uh, few years. And uh, second, what is foreign policy lecture series? What are the target or objective of this foreign policy lecture series? It has three components. Number one, to increase interest in foreign policy among students and scholars, which is typically not very popular topic of discussion among the youth in India. Number two, to provide a unique opportunity to students to get insights in the field of foreign policy through interaction with top leaders and understand India's prime foreign policy challenges and opportunities to them. Third, to provide exclusive opportunity to research scholars and students as well as faculty members to meet and interact with the experts. And we have Professor Sugata Bose. And who is Sugata Bose? Professor Naurem Lokendra will introduce from Delhi to this gathering. And number three, why we have chosen Sugata Bose? There were 10 lists of speakers forwarded by the Ananta Center to the Pai Chancellor of uh, Manipur in October 2017. Since there was no response from the Pai Chancellor, one of the uh, scholars who are known to me have approached me like, why don't you try to conduct, the, conduct this lecture? And he, he sent me 10, 10, 10 uh, research persons' name. And uh, I discuss it along with my senior, uh, with, with my senior colleagues and junior colleagues, and we zero down to Professor Sugata Bose. Considering Sugata Bose work related to area of interest and his association with the Netaji Swasthras, and today we have Professor Sugata Bose to deliver a foreign policy lecture series on India's Asian relations. Thank you. And now I request Professor Lokendra to formally introduce you at the host. Thank you. of the Dais, Professor Sugata Bos, a respected member of Parliament, I am representing the prestigious Zadapur Parliamentary Constituency. My, my colleague, Professor Amare of the Department of Economics, Dr. Razen of the Department of Political Science, Dr. Rara, Center for Manipur Studies, learned scholars and the academics, Dr. Borod from Center for Inclusive and Exclusive Studies, Professor Nimai, the Department of Physics, Manipur University, Professor Ibo, the Department of Political Science, my other colleagues, Dr. Homan, Dr. Sukhajit, Professor, my students, distinguished 
to invite his and ladies and gentlemen. We have today in our midst Dr. Swarta Boss, the Honorable Member of Parliament, Lok Sabha, to deliver the foreign policy lecture on India's Asian relations. It is needless to say that we are extremely grateful to Dr. Boss for his very, very kind gesture. We have indeed been waiting for him and his lecture for quite some time. Dr. Suraga Bose, as all of us know, hails from a very well-known Bose family in West Bengal and the family is integral to the Indian nationalist movement in the early 20th century. It is in fact the great grand nephew of the Tajis Vasakra Bose. Dr. Bose are presently is holding the Guardian and Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard University. He was also the founding director of Harvard South East Institute. Prior to taking up the Gardiner Chair at Harvard in 2001, Dr. Bose served as a fellow at St. Catherine's College, University of Cambridge. He also served as a professor of history and diplomacy at Tufts University. Dr. Bose has a large number of publications to his credit. In addition to seven books dealing with Subhash Chandra Bose's writings, articles, letters, statements, and the politics which he edited, six with Dr. Sisi Kumar Bose and the one with ISR Jalal. Three of his books that he had authored, namely His Majesty's Opponent, Subhash Chandra Bose and the India Struggle Against Empire, published in 2011, A Hundred Horitans, The Indian Ocean in the Age of Global Empire, published in 2006, of Interregional Areas of Travel, only as a thing, got agreements for um, agreeing to visit. Scholars and students, I am truly delighted to be here with you in Imphal, which was the very major center of our anti-colonial struggle during the Second World War. Uh, next year will be the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Imphal, which could have gone either way in military terms. And I hope uh, that I can be with you again uh, on that occasion and also visit Moira, where Shokat Malik of the Indian National Army had uh, raised the Indian tricolor in 1944. The historical background during the first half of the 20th century, but close with some thoughts about the present. And in question and answer, I would of course be very happy to answer any queries that you may have on India's foreign policy challenges today. I have had the privilege of serving for the last four years uh, on the Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs. And we have been especially concerned 
uh, about our relations with China, uh, Southeast Asia, and Japan. Okakura Takuzu's 1903 book, The Ideals of the East, had a memorable first sentence, Asia is one. Sister Nivedita, the Irish-born disciple of Swami Vivekananda, added a further embellishment in her introduction to the book. Asia, the great mother, she wrote, is forever one. There were multiple articulations and alternative visions of this famous claim and disagreements about the extent to which it was tenable. The idea of Asia formed the subject of vigorous intellectual debates. Asia as a space and a concept in the writings of Asian thinkers, many variations on the theme notwithstanding, contained a creative spark absent in the European cartographic depictions of Asia. A world historical transformation is underway in the early 21st century as Asia recovers the global position it had lost some 200 years ago. Even the Chinese President Xi Jinping in announcing the uh, Silk Road Initiative, later renamed the Belt and Road Initiative, talked about Asian interconnections. And we in India have our own vision of connectivity across Asia. Yet the idea of Asia and the spirit of Asian universalism were alive and expressed in a variety of registers during the period of European imperial domination. One of the most innovative exponents of this Asia sense was Rabindranath Tagore. Each country of Asia will solve its own historical problems according to its strength, nature, and need, Tagore said during a visit to Iran in 1932. But the lamp that they will each carry on their path to progress will converge to illuminate the common ray of knowledge. Tagore deserves a prominent place in any prosopography or collective biography of Asian thinkers in the age of European empire. But he was not alone. In 1898, the Chinese intellectual Liang Qijiao arrived in Japan from the languishing Qing empire to witness a new dawn in Asia. His rival Sun Yat-sen, the future founder of the Chinese Republic in 1911, was already ensconced there. Liang's mentor, Kang Yu Wei, was soon to follow. Since the 1880s, Japanese intellectuals had begun to articulate a vision of Asian universalism that found full expression from the turn of the 20th century onwards. Japan's dramatic victory over Russia in 1905 infused young Asians in China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, India, Iran, and Turkey. Tokyo became a magnet, drawing a steady stream of Asian students. In 1907, April, both Liang and Zhang Kaiyang, a Chinese scholar of Buddhism, were present in Japan when young Japanese, Chinese, Indians, Vietnamese, and Filipinos formed an Asian solidarity group in Tokyo. Okakura conveyed the spirit of Asian universalism to India. The Harvard scholar of Japanese art, Ernest Francisco Fenolosa, had inspired him. Okakura would later catalog Fenolosa's magnificent collection of Japanese and Chinese paintings for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It was Okakura who was instrumental in getting Tagore invited to Harvard in 1913 to deliver the lectures in philosophy that were published in a book titled Sadhana or Quest. When Tagore won the Nobel Prize later that year for Gitanjali, the Harvard Students newspaper called The Crimson reported very awkwardly, the Nobel Prize for Literature has recently been awarded to the British Indian poet, Mr. Rabindranath Tagore. This is the first time that the award has been made 
to other than a member of the white race. Last spring, Mr. Tagore gave a series of lectures in English at Emerson Hall dealing with subjects of Far Eastern philosophy. In fact, I teach in Emerson Hall these days. When I go back in September, my main lecture course will take place in that same Emerson Hall where Tagore had spoken in 1913. So you can see that the idea of Asia was articulated in global destinations well beyond the geographical borders of the Asian continent. Asia knows it is true, Okakura had written, nothing of the fierce joys of a time-devouring locomotive, but she has still the far deeper travel culture of the pilgrimage and the wandering monk. Okakura had first come to India in December 1901. He was accompanied by a Buddhist monk, Prince Oda, as well as two American women, Sarah Ul Bull and Josephine McLeod. Both of them were American devotees of Vivekananda. And Vivekananda himself had visited Japan and the United States in the late 19th century. Vivekananda traveled with Okakura to the Buddhist pilgrimage sites of Bodhgaya and Sarnath. It was Vivekananda's favorite Irish disciple, Vivekita, who introduced Okakura to the Tagore family in Calcutta. A cultural and political bridge between East and South Asia was forged. During his 11-month stay, lively conversations animated the Tagore's Jorashako mansions in North Calcutta. Tagore later recalled that it was Okakura, it was from Okakura that we first came to know that there was such a thing as an Asiatic mind. The book, titled The Ideals of the East, was very substantially a collaborative effort of a Japanese and an Asian art critic. The history of Japanese art was for Okakura the history of Asiatic ideals, the beach where each successive wave of Eastern thought has left its sand ripple. Nivedita lauded Okakura for having shown Asia, quote, not as the congeries of geographical fragments that we imagine, but as a united living organism, each part on, dependent on all the others, the whole breathing a single complex life. Okakura took back with him another manuscript from his Indian sojourn titled The Awakening of Asia, which remained unpublished at that time. He did not forget to send precious gifts back to India. He dispatched the famous Japanese artists Taika Yokoyama and Shunso Ishida to Calcutta by early 1903. Obodindranath Tagore, Rabindranath's nephew, learned the Japanese wash technique from Taika and painted the iconic image of Bharat Mata, Mother India, in that style in 1905. Shunso Hishida's rendering of that image on a giant silk scroll was paraded around in procession in the streets of Calcutta. Indian nationalism had come to be fused with Asian universalism. In my book that was just mentioned in the introduction, A Hundred Horizons, I had claimed that Tagore was an eloquent proponent of a universalist aspiration, albeit a universalism with a difference. This specific claim was part of a larger contention that history, modern history, could be interpreted as an interplay of multiple and competing universalisms, rather than as a clash of civilizations. The colonized did not simply erect defensive walls around their notions of cultural difference or the boundaries of their imagined nations. They were keen to be players in broad arenas of cosmopolitan thought zones and wished to contribute to the shaping of a global future. So I have tried to argue in some of my theoretical writings on universalism and cosmopolitanism that you could have a universalism which is leavened with difference and cosmopolitanism and patriotism are not necessarily contradictory phenomena. If you think about a poet like Tagore, 
he wrote beautiful hymns to his motherland, but he was also a critic of narrow nationalism and believed in a cosmopolitan uh, ethos. So I think it's extremely important to accept that uh, there can be love for one's country, which is cosmopolitan in attitude. The Swadesh, or the own country cultural milieu of early 20th century India, despite its interest in rejuvenating indigenous traditions and industries, was not only inward looking. Its protagonists were curious about innovations in different parts of the globe and felt comfortable within ever widening concentric circles of regional patriotisms, Indian nationalism, and a wider Asian universalism. Aspiring to reconcile a sense of nationality with a common humanity, they were not prepared to let colonial borders constrict their imagination. On an eastward voyage in 1916, aboard this ship, Tosamaru, Rabindranath Tagore journeyed from Calcutta to Rangoon, Penang, Singapore, and Hong Kong. That was the usual route that ships took in those days. Calcutta straight east to Rangoon, uh, then to, on to Penang, down to Singapore, and then upwards again towards Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, Tagore made an uncannily accurate prophecy about the future balance of power in the world. The nations which now own the world's resources, he contended, fear the rise of China and wish to postpone the day of that rise. Well, that day was postponed, but it has now arrived. It was in the midst of a frightening storm in the South China Sea on May 21st, 1916, that Tagore composed his song, Bhuvano Jara Ashonakhani, asking the Almighty to spread his seat of universality in the individual's heart. And this is my translation of that song. Your universe encompassing prayer mat, spread it out in the core of my heart. The night stars, the day's sun, all the shades of darkness and light, all your messages that fill the sky, let them find their abode in my heart. May the mute of the universe fill the depths of my soul with all its tunes, all the intensity of grief and joy, the flower's touch, the storm's touch. Let your compassionate, auspicious, generous hands bring it to the core of my heart. On May 29, 1916, the ship Tosamaru reached the Japanese port of Kobe. Tegor's three-month sojourn in Japan represented the fulfillment not just of a personal quest, but the search for an Asian universalism that had begun at the beginning of the century. His direct encounter with the power and scale of art in Japan led him to urge Indian artists to look east after rebuking Japan on that count, that Tagore undertook the long Pacific crossing to North America on September 7, 1916. When he was in Japan, Tagore had received an invitation to visit Vancouver, and he flatly rejected it. He, uh, in 1914, Canadian authorities had cruelly turned back the Komagata Maru carrying Indian immigrants. Well aware of the Komagata Maru incident, Tagore refused to travel to either Canada or Australia until these dominions withdrew their discriminatory immigration policies. Among the white dominions of the British Empire, Australia had instituted an unambiguous whites-only immigration policy. Canada chose a more hypocritical path. A continuous voyage clause in the immigration law barred all those who did not arrive on an unbroken journey from their country of origin. A little gentle pressure on the shipping lines was all that was required to suspend operations on the Calcutta-Vancouver route. Ironically, the ship that took Tagore across the Pacific was named Canada Bar. But Tagore disembarked in Seattle, and he went on a lecture tour from the west to the east coast of the United States, delivering a powerful critique of nationalism. 
In fact, he said that nationalism was an anesthetic that had been invented by man. It was a presidential election season. Woodrow Wilson won re-election by a very small margin, proclaiming that he had kept his country out of war. Once the United States entered the war in 1917, Wilson's promise of national self-determination raised hopes among subjugated peoples across the world. I have a much more detailed discussion of Tagore's book, Nationalism, in my book, The Nation as Mother, which was published in uh, August of 2017. Um, Tagore was very precise. Uh, he, of course, criticized nationalism, nationalism in America. Uh, he uh, said that uh, the Americans uh, either kept the aliens out through their immigration policies or reduced them into slavery. And he also had something very perceptive to say about nationalism in India. He actually said that we have certain social habits in our country which makes us very intolerant of even food habits of our neighbors. And this, he felt, would lead to engines of coercion. And speaking in Parliament in August of 2017, I looked at the Prime Minister across the aisle and asked him to stop the engines of coercion in their tracks. But in any case, at the end of the First World War, most Asian anti-imperialists were not inward looking. They harbored universalist aspirations and were keen to establish connections that transcended the boundaries of their own nations. Woodrow Wilson had a formidable rival in Vladimir Ilyich Lenin for anti-colonial hearts and minds in Asia. The limited reach of Wilsonian benevolence, limited as it was to Europe, came as a huge disappointment to Asians, and Lenin won that particular contest hands down. Yet godless Bolshevik internationalism had to contend with pre-existing bonds of Asian solidarity and a range of religiously tinged universalisms. Far from being the Wilsonian moment, as some historians have argued, the years 1919 to 1922 constituted the quintessential Islamic universal moment in global history, casting even the 1905 spirit of Asian universalism into the shade. The mass non-cooperation and Khilafat movement orchestrated by Mahatma Gandhi and the Ali brothers, Muhammad and Shaukat Ali, tied Indian nationalism to Islamic universalism. Let Hindus not be frightened by pan-Islamism, Gandhi wrote in his journal, Young India. It is not, it need not be anti-Indian or anti-Hindu. For Gandhi, a territorial conception of nationalism was perfectly compatible with an extraterritorial anti-colonial sentiment. The abolition of the institution of the Khilafat by Mustafa Kamal Atatürk in 1924 led many Indian nationalists to rekindle the land of Asian universalism. Rabindranath Tagore set off for East Asia again, accompanied by a painter, Nandalal Bose, and two scholars of comparative religion and politics, Kitty Mohan Sen, who happens to be uh, the grandfather of Amartya Sen, and Kalidas Na. One of Tagore's hosts that year in China was none other than Liang Chicha. In welcoming Tagore, Liang evoked the age-old brotherly affection between India and China. The radical Chinese youth, who had their baptism of fire in the May 4th movement of 1919, mistook the modern Indian poet to be a traditionalist and derided the message of spirituality from a defeated nation. The Asian universalist turned in the domain of Mahavadika and was introduced in Thames. That Asia was my idea of Asia. Great things without dismembering the Chinese, standing at the fulfillment in every place. And not at least this part of the world, the areas August 1941, having the nation to kill itself. In 1943, a haunting image of Anuruddin in her hands. Stretching from Singapore to Calcutta, submarine voyage, which included 
a mid-ocean transfer from a German to a Japanese submarine. During Netaji's first year in the last daring Gambit failed, the second year from mid-1944 to August 1945, saw tested the metal of the Army of Liberation and its leader, for the truth of freedom. Delhi still little bar, leading to the interior of the tropics. Netaji addressed his first public press conference in June 1919, 1943, in Tokyo, attended by about six It is, however, certain that once India is free, these ties will be revived and strengthened. The freedom that we shall win through our sacrifices and exertions, he argued, we shall be able to preserve with our own strength. He followed up his media interaction with a series of serial of freedom-loving Indians begins to flow. Will India attain a freedom of exile since 1915? You might well ask what I have been in Tokyo for, Rashmi Hari told the gathering, or what present I have brought for you. Well, I have brought for you this present, he said, turning to Shuhash amidst thunderous cheers and slogans from the audience. This year is the 75th anniversary of the Azad Hind movement. And in fact, my next lecture is going to be in Singapore on Saturday, where on 25th July, the people of Singapore will be celebrating uh, Netaji's assumption of the supreme command of the High Name on the 5th of July, which he described as the proudest day of his life. And then later, uh, his proclamation of the Azad Hind government in Singapore on 21st of October 1943. So here are some pictures. Uh, this is Chandra uh, Bose taking the salute uh, in front of the municipal building of Singapore. Uh, in front of him is the Padam or the Maidan of Singapore where 12,000 soldiers of the INA had gathered. On his left you see Muhammad Zaman Kiani, the commander of the first division of, of the INA who led the Azad Hind force forces uh, in the battlefields around, uh, around Imphal. Here is the INA in formation in Singapore on the Padam. This is Netaji reviewing his uh, troops. Here he is uh, proclaiming the provisional government of, uh, of free India. Uh, this is a remarkable year in Shubhash Chandra Bose's life. Just imagine, uh, in January he was in Europe trying to find a way to get to Asia. Then he manages to do that uh, via a 90-day submarine voyage between February and May 1943. And in February, Gandhiji was in jail. He was on a hunger strike. The British were prepared to let him die uh, in, in detention. And here was Shubhashan Bose showing fight and mobilizing Indians outside Southeast Asia. Now, after proclaiming the provisional government of free India, he went to Japan in uh, November of 1943. And on this visit, he was hosted at the home of Shibusawa Shakuro, the governor of Japan's Reserve Bank, whose father had presided over Meiji Japan's financial reforms in the late 19th century. The Meiji Constitution Day on November 3rd provided the occasion for a visit to the Meiji Shrine and Tokyo's Museum of Art. Art had always bound together India and Japan. So even in the middle of the Second World War, Itachi was visiting uh, Tokyo for political purposes, but he made sure that he visited uh, the Art Museum in Uene. The primary purpose was to attend the Greater East Asia Conference of, on November 5th and 6th, 1943. Netaji, according to the Japanese Foreign Office, chose to be an observer because he was of the opinion that India would not join the Greater East Asia co prosperity sphere. <coughs> Despite his observer status, Bose's imposing figure dominated the proceedings. Rising to speak on the second day, Netaji said he had visualized the panorama of the world's history as he listened to the proceedings. My thoughts went back to the Congress of Vienna in 1815, after the downfall of the Napoleonic Empire, to the Congress of Paris in 1856, after the Crimean War, 
to the Congress of Berlin in 1878 after the Russo-Turkish War in the Balkans, to the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919 at the end of the last war, to the Washington Conference held in 1921 for ensuring Anglo-American domination of the Pacific and the Far East, and to the Locarno Conference in 1925 for ingeniously binding the hands of the German people once and for all. My thoughts also went back to the Assembly of the League of Nations, that League of Nations along whose corridors and lobbies I spent many a day knocking at one door after another in the vain attempt to obtain a hearing for the cause of Indian freedom. The Tokyo Conference he claimed was different. It had not been convened for dividing the spoils among the conquerors, hatching a conspiracy to victimize a weak power, or trying to defraud a weak neighbor. India had by now learned to distinguish between false and real universalism and favored a true internationalism which did not ignore nationalism but is rooted in it. An international society of nations could only be created in his view on the foundation of, quote, regional federations, unquote. This was not said for the benefit of his hosts but was something in which he genuinely believed having called upon the British Empire in the past to transform itself into a federation of free nations. It's less than altruistic Japanese sponsorship not, notwithstanding, the five principles adopted in the joint declaration, justice, national sovereignty, reciprocity in international relations, mutual aid and assistance, and racial equality, presaged by a dozen years the Panchshield Res Resolution adopted by Afro-Asian nations at Bandung in 1955. By the way, Shigemitsu was the Japanese foreign minister in 1943, and he was the Japanese prime minister by the time Bandung took place in 1955. Bose's speech, according to the Japanese record, held the entire assembly in awe. His emotions, foresight, vast knowledge, and obvious strength of character combined to produce an admirable effect. At the end of his speech, the Japanese government announced that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands would be handed over to the provisional government of Azad Hind. In the following days, Netaji was invited to address a mass meeting in Libya Park, and he obtained the Army Chief General Sugiyama's agreement to regard the INA as an allied army and to accept his plans regarding the second and third divisions of the INA and he also put in requests for equipment to build a navy and an air force. Shubhashandra Bose visited Indian students at their hostel. Like a mother, the Japanese narrative states, he showered his heartfelt affection on them and inspired them by his words to devote themselves to the future well-being of their motherland. He decided to leave all the gifts he had received, including a Japanese sword with the Shibusawa family, saying he would take them only when India was free. This sword is now in uh, the Nitaji Museum at Nitaji Kobon in Kolkata. General Fujiwara presented it to my father in a special ceremony in 1967. He had charmed the entire Shibusawa family, especially the children and their staff, who felt in the whole wide world they could not find many lovable personalities like Bose. The conflict between Japan and China had troubled Netaji since the 1930s. He had wanted to visit China in 1940, but the British had not allowed it. On November 18, 1943, Netaji left the shores of Japan and went to China. He paid his homage to Sun Yat-sen, the father of the 1911 Chinese Republic, at his memorial in Nanjing. In a broadcast from Nanjing on November 20th, he described Sun Yat-sen as a sincere believer in the liberation of Asia and in Asian unity. On November 21st, 1943, he broadcast a second appeal, he had already broadcast a first appeal before, to Chungking from Shanghai. The Indian people, he said, really sympathize with China and the Chinese people. He reminded the Chungking government that as president of the Congress, 
he had sent out the first medical mission to China as a token of sympathy for the Chinese people in 1938. He urged Chung Ying not to send troops to India to fight against us on the side of the British. He tried to suggest that 1943 was not 1937 and that East Asia faced an entirely new situation. He looked forward to the day not far off when by means of an honorable peace, Japan would withdraw her troops from China. Netaji mentioned Mahatma Gandhi's statement the previous year that had India been free, Gandhi would have been em embarked on a mission to bring peace between China and Japan. He left behind his aide, Abid Hassan, for a number of days to try and hold talks with representatives of the Chungking government. However, by now, Chiang Kai-shek was being given a seat at the high table by, by the Allies, with, by Roosevelt and Churchill, and had little incentive to respond to an overture from an Indian freedom fighter allied at that time with Japan. While Japan was clearly the colonial aggressor in Northeast Asia, the situation in Southeast Asia was more complex. In this vast region, Japan played an instrumental role in defeating and destroying the mystique of Western imperial powers, the British in Burma and Malaya, the French in Indochina, the Dutch in the East Indies, and the Americans in the Philippines. You know, Netaji was in Burma as early as uh, late July, August 1943, and he tried to send rice from Burma to Bengal, which was being ravaged by the famine that I mentioned. But the British had nervously suppressed the, that particular uh, offer. Now, in Indochina, the Japanese found it expedient to work with the Vichy French and shifted too late in 1945 to supporting some Vietnamese nationalists. This enabled the communists in the Viet Minh to adopt the nationalist mantle. Elsewhere, the Japanese supported Asian nationalists to a greater or lesser degree. The Indians, the Burmese, the Indonesians, and some Malays and Filipinos took advantage of the Japanese undermining of Western colonial authority to advance their own independence movements. In Indonesia, Mohammed Sukarno and Mohammed Hatta had been released from long years in Dutch prisons by the Japanese. They accepted Japanese help to build their civilian administration and train their military between 1942 and 1945. Even though the Indonesian proclamation of independence did not come until August 1945, wartime developments would make a Dutch reconquest of Indonesia as difficult as the reassertion of colonial rule in Bali. After the Battle of Imphal in 1944, Netaji found one last occasion to give his views on the fundamental problems of India when he was invited to address the faculty and students at Tokyo University in November of 1944. He argued in what has come to be called his Tokyo thesis that the creative faculty of its people and their determination to resist imperialist domination gave ample proof of India's vitality as a nation. He dwelt skillfully on the theme of Indian modernity and offered finely edged assessments of Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore. Bose was able to delineate with a clarity for a foreign audience what he thought would be the three most urgent tasks facing free India. National defense, eradication of poverty, and provision education for all. An international order, he argued, could only be built on the foundation of associations of regional cooperation. Citing the failure of the League of Nations, he urged Japan as the sponsor nation of Asian regionalism to, quote, avoid a selfish and short-sighted policy and work on a moral basis, unquote. But it is always difficult for any leader or any sponsor nation to do exactly that. Avoid a selfish and short-sighted policy and work on a moral basis. But at that moment, an intellectual quest began to discover what a Japanese scholar of modern Chinese literature, Takeuchi Yoshimi, evocatively called in a 1960 lecture, Asia as method. 
He added a caveat to say it was impossible to definitely state what this might be. In the domain of culture, Japanese art enabled the spirit of an Asian universalism to survive the negative consequences of Japanese nationalistic imperialism. One example was Mulal Bose's celebration of the Indian countryside in his art, created in drawing of the Japanese Sumi Ezra. So this is an Asian landscape. The idea of Asia and the spirit of Asian universalism were in important ways products of cosmopolitan pop zones created by passages across the Indian Ocean. In this sense, the continent and the ocean were not necessarily in an adversarial relationship, but provided different contours of interregional arenas animated by those of India's culture. Vinay Kumar Shakar, the father of Indian astrology, in the modern review in the 1910s, stressed both sea lanes and land routes in creating what he called an Asia sense. In the late 1920s and 1930s, scholars affiliated with the Greater India Society in Calcutta began to emphasize the relative importance of the oceanic voyages across the Bay of Bengal. But in my view, both overland routes and oceanic routes are equally important. Tagore and many of his Asian intellectual intellectuals were votaries of alternative modernity. They did not wish to imitate Western modernity, but that did not make them traditionalist. They offered their own visions of modernity. There is sometimes a tendency to exaggerate the element of anti-Westernism in Asian thought. All that the best Asian thinkers were questioning was the European claim to monopoly on universalism. They were quite skillful in negotiating and even accepting knowledge from the West while taking a strong stand against Western imperialist power. Tagore's vision of creative unity certainly had a close scope as did his travels. Yet Asia became a privileged geography of relations for Tagore and many of his contemporaries. Most Asian individuals at the age of empire were not forbears of political activity.
the world of contemporary
the early 21st century is emerging as the moment of reconvergence with some prospects of Asia outstripping Europe and the West on key indicators of economic performance. So the decade of the 2010s may represent the close of a temporal cycle that commenced in the 1810s with manufacturing and financial clout now shifting back to Asia. Any new history of ideas and economic life in Asia should not view the continent as composed of discrete and separate nation states, but rather as an arena of circulation and connection. And the challenge for our foreign policy theorists is also to think in this new way. Flows of culture and commerce may yet prevail over interstate competition and conflict in a post-imperialist and potentially post-nationalist Asia. Now, I'm not minimizing the challenges that we face. For example, our competition with China in Central Asia or the Indian Ocean. China has acquired a military base in Djibouti last year. Uh, it has acquired a piece of the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. It is financing other ports in Myanmar and Pakistan. China has articulated its vision of what it sees as the future of a connected world. It is time that we in India articulated our vision, and I truly believe that we haven't fully deployed our soft power potential. There are so many connections of India and different regions of India with Southeast and East Asia that we really need to draw on in articulating a new foreign policy uh, for India in the Indian Ocean and the Asian arenas. In re-envisioning the idea of Asia for what many anticipate will be an Asian century, it is also necessary to take a normative and ethical position on the side of a generous universalism against the hubris of an arrogant imperialism and narrow nationalism. The most sophisticated Asian intellectuals of the last two centuries aspired to keep that lofty goal in their sights, even if not everyone managed to climb up the slippery path and reach the, reach the deep. To conclude, let me return to what Tagore had said in Iran in 1932. No one had put it better. He wrote, we are the people of Asia. Grievances against Europe are in our blood. Ever since their pirates and marauders came to suck the blood of this weak continent in the 18th century, they have disgraced themselves before us. If a new age has dawned in Asia, let Asia give it utterance in a new authentic voice. If instead Asia merely imitates Europe's beastly cry, were it even to be the lion's roar, he used the Bengali phrase Shingona, even if it were to be the lion's roar, it will be a loss. Thank you very much.
future. This is my discussion. Thank you. Uh, illuminating talk from Professor Sudhata Bose. But as a student of history, I would like to say a few things and please see if it can be linked up with what Professor Bose has said. If we visit Southeast Asia, particularly Cambodia, Thailand, and even Vietnam, and of course, part in Myanmar also, the cultural influence, Indian cultural influence, have been so extensive, and uh, some of the Indian historian, like uh, Arsina Zunda, in the Bharati Vidyavan series, discussed quite extensively on that. Then, coming back again on the question of the spread of I mean, religion, coming of the Chinese, you know, Yuan Shan and Fai Yen, and Nalanda, and all these places being the cradle of. I mean, spiritual and other, I mean, philosophical ideas. There have been a lot of cultural expansion in this part of the country. And uh, some kind of a consciousness, even earlier to the period that, I mean, Professor Bose is really, among the different nations and nation states which have emerged, and the small, small kingdoms and principalities which have emerged in this part of the country, say Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. The kind of a one kind of a cultural expansion, one kind of influences cross cultural, cross regional interplay and influences from one part to another and from another part to another, reinforcing itself, I think that have played a considerably important role in developing the kind of a consciousness which ultimately reflected of Rabi and uh, uh, it is uh, precisely this philosophy, you know, of uh, transgressing the so-called, what you have mentioned, the narrow nationalism which has really uh, enamored me in your lecture today. Uh, but, the, but the two questions uh, which has come to my mind, which, which you maybe ponder that, was this, first of all, you know, Manipur has been thinking towards East. We have this phrase called no Kok Thong Hang Ba, which means uh, uh, opening the doors of the East. You know, there's a phrase in Manipur. And we are waiting for that day. And uh, this is predominantly, uh, you know, we have, we have got very strong, uh, you know, belief in that. Predominantly after the, you know, the so-called the conversion to Hinduism and the, you know, Indian uh, Indian state coming into Manipur, uh, you know. So we, that in trying to assert our identity, we are looking towards the east, and we are very proud to look towards the east. So we are already doing that, and we want to do that. What you said in your lecture. Another thing which comes to my mind is this, that when we are talking about foreign policies today, you know, I mean, do we even understand what is India today? How do we define India as a composite unit? We, we, we don't know how to define it. So because we, we, we have cultures from West, we have cultures from South, and we have cultures from North, East and East, we can't somehow amalgamate them, you know, psychologically, culturally. So in that context, uh, of course, there's a very strong need towards foreign policy. But do we uh, go ahead with foreign policy with an imagined India, or do we have a concrete India? I do not have a question, but I would rather say that in in recent years. I don't know we should call it cultural diplomacy or Cultural diplomacy has become a very, very popular thing 
in international politics. And the cultural dimension was not given so much importance as it is today. One day, one Japanese professor, Okamoto Koshi of Kyoto Shangyo University, gave a lecture at Manipur University on 2,000 years of India's relations with Japan. We were wondering how he could cover this particular aspect in an hour's time. Almost the same thing has been done by our professor today on his years, uh, India's relations with Asia. It was so fast, one sentence can be explained in one minute. And uh, at the same time, if I'm allowed to speak a little bit, I was wondering how a Buddhist culture dominated Japanese society could switch over to taking various types of meat, beef, pork, etc., etc. Then I found that it was only during the Meiji time that the Japanese started taking beef. No before that. Why? Then I, while I was wondering about this small thing, then a thesis was sent from Jawaharlal Nehru University about the Japanese changing style of menu. And he says that because of the influence of Buddhism, the Japanese and the Chinese did not take me. And it was only after the Meiji Restoration that the Japanese started taking beef because of protein rich content. Then even the Emperor, he himself, Emperor Meiji, Japanese emperors do not have a surname, only one name, Meiji. I saw things like that, Ruruko, like that. So, Maisi himself declared that he has started taking the switching over from the traditional Japanese style of uh, food habits. Then, once the emperor follows, then the people follow. That is the type of culture the Japanese have. They have a very unique place. Then, as our professor has spoken about ACS universalism, Buddhism has a lot of things to do, cultural aspects has a lot of things to do. And uh, you will be wondering how the ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N, ASEAN, they declare Southeast Asia region and nuclear fusion. There was no problem, no signature, nothing. Just an understanding. Once you have that kind of understanding, it is obligatory on the parts of the nations to follow it. Because it is mostly based on cultural values, cultural aspects. Probably influenced by India, probably influenced by Confucianism, probably influenced by other cultural aspects of Southeast Asia and the East Asia. And uh, you know that ASEAN Economic Regional Organization is considered to be one of the most successful organizations. When India was in economic crisis, when India for Japan, when Japan declined, ASEAN said, yes, we will help you. Then the type of Asian thinking, Asian universalism, is very much inherent in most of the Southeast Asian countries. Of course, it is a new area for us in Manipur University. It is only a recently introduced area, but we find so many, so many things which we can study. And uh, our professor, Professor Sugata Bose has enlightened us about the relevance of Asian universalism.
Japan's philosophy, Asia for Asia Tech, and for East Asia Prosperity. And uh, you will be surprised when the foreign investment of Japan largely goes to this area. Not less than 25 percent. At one time, it went mostly to China. Of course, it appears to be there appears to be a conflict. I'm sure this will be resolved. I don't. I don't. I, I don't think there is a conflict between India and China, of course, militarily, but not economically. Economically, India has got the largest business partner with China. So, it depends on the wisdom and the formulation of the foreign policy. We should also try to forget about our past the 1962 experience, for example. So, I would say that History writing these days, it is not only based on political history, that is outdated. Cultural history based on paintings, then arts and culture, then so many things, so many things that Professor Sugata has highlighted, which was so illuminating. This is a new eye opener to our. Students. Sir, they are mostly our students. So, I never studied Indian history except in my graduation. I did my MA in Western history. And then at one time, I was really surprised when Japan was not recognized in equal terms after the end of the First World War. That was regarded as a yellow race. That was regarded as yellow race. The same thing with India. Anyway, these are small, small things. So I must say that cultural aspect is a very, very powerful aspect in diplomacy in international politics today, which has been, which has been highlighted by, uh, by our professor very, in a very illuminating way. Thank you, Professor, so much, so much. Uh, so I have quite like two questions. Um, first, I want to know uh, what uh, type of programs exist for you to, to further engage and participate in this uh, Asiatic vision. And the second is, um, if this look is faces uh, up in its true sense, then what are the challenges you see, and especially for the northeast, and how should the northeast prepare for it? Thank you for those uh, excellent uh, questions and comments. Uh, first, uh, there was a question about uh, whether there will be one Asia in the future. Of course, I began my lecture with uh, Okakura's rhetorical uh, statement, Asia is one. But what I believe is that in the future, uh, we will find an interconnected and interreferential Asia. You know, if you want genuine unity, you also have to know how to respect differences. Whether it's within India or in Asia as a whole. So I envision closer connections and an Asia where different countries will be prepared to learn from one another. That will be... Um, a better and a longer lasting kind of Asian unity and also the most dignified expression of Asian universalism. So I want to give a nuanced answer to that question uh, that was put to me about the oneness of Asia. Second, yes of course, uh, the cultural contacts uh, between South Asia and Southeast Asia go back millennia. And one point that I would like to emphasize is that Indian culture spread to Southeast Asia not just during the period of great empires, you know, 
Maurya or Gupta. Um, if you think about Cambodia, you know, those cultural links were forged when there was relative political decentralization in India between the period of the Maurya and the Gupta empires. Or think of uh, the connections with Sri Vijay. You know, there was the Chola kingdom in South India, which was carrying on trade and also spreading culture. So you can have a federal India which will have very close ties with Southeast Asia. And I would add a word of caution. When we talk about cultural influence, we should avoid talking in terms of Indian colonization of Southeast Asia. Uh, I think we have to respect the creative faculties of the people of Southeast Asia. And this is a kind of respect that Rabindranath Tagore showed when he went to Southeast Asia in 1927. If you read his book, Java Jatri Potro, you know, Letters of a Traveler to Java, he's saying that the versions of the Ramana and the Mahabharata in Southeast Asia are as original as the versions to be found in India. So, so we must be very, very careful. Southeast Asia is not entirely formed either by Indian influence or Chinese influence. The peoples of Southeast Asia know how to creatively adapt influences coming from India and China and then give it and uh, give, give you know, their own culture uh, a, a sense of authenticity and originality. So that I think is very, very important to remember when we offer modern interpretations of ancient cultural bonds between South and Southeast Asia. Yes, third, I have been making many you know, powerful arguments, drawing on some of our best political thinkers of the anti-colonial era against uh, uh, narrow uh, nationalism. And I'm aware of uh, Monipur's uh, conception of opening the, do or the doors towards the, the East. But this question, what do we understand when we say India? Uh, this is a very profound one. Um, and um, obviously, there is an Indian state with a foreign policy establishment, uh, which will play a leading role in the formulation of foreign policy. But what I would say is that, first of all, it is very important to not just consult regions, but accept ideas from different regions when we forge our foreign policy. So for example, I think Punjab has a special role to play if we are to have a breakthrough with Pakistan in the future. West Bengal and the other states surrounding Bangladesh will have a special role to play in maintaining and enhancing good relations with Bangladesh. When it comes to Myanmar and beyond Myanmar, the whole of Southeast Asia, I think ideas and inputs from India's Northeast ought to be of critical uh, importance. And how can we forget that when we talk about connections with other parts of the Indian Ocean world, it's sometimes specific regions which have had closer connections. So if you think about some parts of the Middle East and Africa, the Gujarati connections were very strong. But if you think about Southeast Asia, Malaya, Singapore, Thailand, the connections from South, in South India, particularly Tamil Nadu, were very strong. Which is why even in Netaji Zazab in Forge, they were Punjabi and Pathan professional soldiers, but there were large numbers of Tamil civilian recruits, those who had gone to work in their rubber plantations there, and so forth. Uh, so I think that regions have a have a role to, uh, have a role to play, and the purpose of these Ananta lectures is in fact to involve the regions, but also civil society. If we leave foreign policy making only to the mandarins, that is the mantris, and there again there is an etymological connection between the two terms, then I think we cannot have 
you know, creative departures in our foreign policy, which are sometimes very much sort of needed. And that's why professors, scholars, intellectuals, students, they all must take an intelligent interest in foreign affairs uh, if we are to build a new era of peace and prosperity in, in Asia. I, uh, and I do, of course, accept that uh, culture, cultural diplomacy is a very important point. That was the fourth, uh, uh, fourth question. And one word that was used was wisdom. Wisdom is actually something that we must seek out in the conduct uh, of our uh, foreign policy. And yes, I do believe that even though in any scenario where you have a rising power like China, there will be an element of competition. But I think that relations with China are perfectly manageable. And I do believe that there are many common interests. You know, uh, there are, of course, strong economic ties. And that you see even between Japan and China. I was recently in China in May. I had gone to Peking University to uh, uh, take part uh, in their World University Presidents Forum and Beijing Forum on the uh, occasion of the 120th anniversary of Peking University. And the university very generously made me honorary visiting professor for a week, and I delivered four lectures. And I could, uh, I could definitely see uh, that uh, in the, in me, what was going on was that China wants to keep relations with its Asian neighbors in good repair, because at this moment, Trump's unpredictability and also his trade war against the rest of the world poses a very major challenge. China wishes to concentrate on that and therefore there have been talks with India. Even while I was in China, the Chinese Prime Minister went to Indonesia and talked to the ASEAN leaders. He then went to Japan and the Japanese and the Chinese Prime Ministers had you know, a better talks in May of this year than they had for a very long time in the past. But even leaving aside the short term, uh, I think in the longer term, there are many commonalities, economic and cultural, which can be the bedrock for not just peaceful, but mutually beneficial Asian, uh, Asian relations. Finally, the youth have a you know, big role to play. Do we give them enough of, of a space? Maybe not. There are, of course, events that take place, even as we are speaking here, the Asian Games are happening in Indonesia, where the youths of Asia are having an opportunity to mingle with one another. And I hope that will lead to a better understanding of, of one another. That's just one kind of a forum, a sporting forum. But my own sense is that students uh, must actually play a much uh, a, a bigger role. And there have to be uh, non-official communications. We cannot limit ourselves to state-to-state -state contacts. We keep talking about people-to-people -people contacts, but there is not enough of it. And and when we think about people-to-people -people contacts, we must, in fact, think about our young people. I'll just give you an example. India and Pakistan have very poor relations just at this moment. Yet, there was a connected classroom between the Jindal Law School and the Lahore University of Management Sciences in earlier this year. And the students from Lamas in Pakistan came and visited the Jindal Law School in Haryana. These kinds of exchanges should take place. And so far as the Northeast is concerned, I think students from the Northeast educational institutions, I would say Manipur Central University, once the strike is over, will be able to take an initiative to have exchanges of their professors and their students with some of the finest universities in Asia, particularly in East Asia and Southeast Asia. That's how our youth can be involved and students from the Northeast, I think, have a very major role to play as our ambassadors 
in the countries of Southeast Asia and East Asia. So thank you very much. Professor Surata, my colleagues, colleagues and friends, and friends. when uh, listening to Professor Surata course, is much more than an academic happening for us. It is an emotional affair as well. Take the name of boss and put Netazi before that, the Indian population of Manipur will get into tears in no time. So listening to you and uh, to be with you in this discussion has been much more than an academic event for us. Well, before I come to the matters or methodological issues, wonderfully raised in the paper, I would like to say certain things. What exactly struck me when I listened to the lecture first? Well, for us, the concept of India is a very recent one, and for the concept of world, this side doesn't go beyond Bengal. For us, there is no difference between West Bengal and Bangladesh. In fact, for us, historically and culturally, Bengal is Bangladesh. Fundamentally, a little further, Calcutta may be there, but for us, Bangladesh is our Bengal. That is the concept of West with which we all grew up. And the concept of Asia, which you have so wonderfully put from the perspective of the intellectual thinkers of this period, and from the engagement of political leaders of this period. Well, for us, the concept of Asia fundamentally looks towards the East, towards East and Southeast Asia. Our concept, people in our region, when we talk of concept, our concept of Asia is not on this side, is on this side. That is exactly where the beauty of your wonderful lecture comes to us. Well, all along, of course, Asia right now is an area where the students and teachers of Manipur State tap an intense interest. Asia now demands intense interest for among faculty and the students. And that means we take intense interest in this part of the world. Of course, we start from Bangkok. When we start taking interest, we start taking interest from Bengal, considerably for other regions. But as I said once again, our concept of Bengal makes no distinction between West Bengal and Bangladesh. For us, Bengal is Bangladesh and West Bengal together. And when it comes to Asia, that's where we have a problem. Our concept of Asia, if we look at this side, we are right now well, very easily landed as anti Indians. Because the Indian, the Indian concept of patriotism, as of now, the concept of nationalism, is very exclusivist, very exclusivist. It, it thinks of building a strong, powerful country. India has been thinking of making ourselves a very powerful country. India has never thought of making herself a powerful nation and it is becoming increasingly exclusive in the concept of the country. But for us, our concept of nation is much more robust than the concept of country. We have more trust in the concept of nation than in the concept of country. That is where Saudis and East Asia become very, very relevant and it necessarily demands interest in us. That is exactly where, well, the Tazis and the Zapas, and for us, for example, for the people of Manipur, Second World War is an academic concern. For us, it was Zapan War. We all grew up with stories of Zapan Lam, that is Zapan War, not stories of World War II. And when we talk of Zapan War, Netazi is Subhash Chakra's name. We just call it Netazi, Netazi, or Netazi box. Well, comes automatically, spontaneously, these two names when we get associated. The moment we talk of history like that, we talk of our feelings like that, then we become anti-Indian. Very easily, we are just like an anti-Indian. 
with that interest in research and the understanding of our relationship or better understanding of our own concept of nation. Necessarily, we have to dive into the historical experiences of these countries. Well, it is, in fact, it is easier for Sugata to look at the history of this part of the world than we ourselves try to do it. If we try to do it, well, we become anti-national and anti-Indian. For Sugata, it's a scholarly work. That is where we are in today. That is exactly where, when Professor Sukhana Bhatt puts in a framework of understanding the concept of Asia from the Bengal angle, from the end of Bengal angle, that too from the Bengal, Bengal intellectuals and Bengali activists, Bengali political leaders, and trying to put it as a method of appreciating the perspective of developing how you look at different countries. That is exactly where it, we, we need to walk further into uh, the lines which Professor Sukhata has in turn. With this, it was wonderful listening to you, and we definitely look forward to looking forward to the work. With this, I look because Dr. Vizal has to carry uh, well, because of what of times. Well, here we are towards the end of the program, and it's mandatory to give both of thanks, and here I am giving the both of thanks. But I, I, uh, I cannot uh, help but to be very, very academically gratifying, you know, after listening to your uh, lecture. And uh, I hope uh, we pursue the connection with you uh, in future vis-a-vis -vis Manipur University and School of Social Sciences. And uh, so I would like to say, Oja goes, uh, that is how we include you in our family, because Oja means uh, respected teacher, uh, a term for teacher. So I will address you as Oja. Oja goes, thank you so much for coming here and enlightening us. Wish we could uh, be more representative, uh, but unfortunately the situation is such that. So we would like you to come again. We will let you go with the promise that you will come again. <laughs> and uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for coming and we are referential. Uh, element in your lecture will be academically seriously looked into. Thank you very much. And I would also uh, thank very much uh, Oja Lokhe uh, for introducing so very well uh, Oja Bose and Oja Amma for eliminating uh, you know, the, the crux of the lecture uh, from Oja Bose and of course uh, Oja Rajan uh, for organizing such a wonderful lecture. We are very grateful to you. And I also would like to extend my thanks to the esteemed academia sitting here and all the lovely students who have come. I wish you could bring more of your friends next time. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you and also the press, a very integral part of our society. I would like you to thank, I like to really thank all of you. Thank you very much.